In this video, I'll give you a quick summary of the concepts of Unity's data-oriented technology stack, but the details, including the API, are covered in other videos of this playlist. Dots is comprised of these four elements. The job system enables us to utilize multiple cores by creating units of work called jobs, and the burst compiler optionally can be used to compile the code of these jobs, generating highly optimized code. ECS is a new way of structuring data and code that avoids the performance and organization problems of Unity's conventional game objects. The E stands for entity, which is a logical ID. The C stands for component, which is a piece of data associated with an entity. And the S stands for system, which is a unit of code executed in the game loop. Lastly, Project Tiny is a new engine runtime that supports only dots, stripping out support for conventional Unity features, and thus stripping out unnecessary overhead in games that don't use them. So firstly, let's look at the job system. Without the job system, multi-threading requires us to create and manage threads ourselves, as well as to manually synchronize access to data that's shared between the threads. When using the job system, it creates and manages a pool of threads for us, usually one per CPU core. We then create units of work called jobs and add them to the job system queue. The job system then farms these jobs from the queue to the pool of threads as the threads become available. We leave it up to the system to decide precisely which jobs run on which threads in what order, and once a job is running on a thread, it is never preempted by other jobs. While a job runs, its thread is occupied until the job finishes. For primarily this reason, the job system is not appropriate for doing I.O. work. If a job were to wait for I.O., its thread would be wastefully idle during that time, thus thwarting our goal of maximizing utilization of the cores. So jobs are intended only for doing computation on in-memory data. Now, it may be the case that two or more concurrently scheduled jobs access the same data. If the shared data is only read, then there's no problem, but if one or more of the jobs mutate the data, we usually then want to ensure these jobs run in a certain order and not overlap in execution. The job system lets us do this by specifying dependencies between jobs. If we tell the job system that job A is dependent upon job B, then the job system will make sure job B finishes executing before job A starts. A job can have multiple direct dependencies, and those dependencies can have their own dependencies, and a job will not start executing until all of its dependencies have finished. So the idea is that by splitting our workload into separate jobs and creating dependencies between them only where they're needed, we can maximize the use of the cores. In this diagram, each box represents a job and each arrow points in the direction of dependency. Job D, for example, must wait for B and C to finish before it starts executing, and B first must wait for A. Be clear though that because A and C have no dependencies, they need not wait for any other job. On the right side of D, jobs E, F, and G all must wait for D to finish, and in turn, H must wait for G, and I must wait for H. Again, be clear that though E, F, and G all must wait for D, they need not wait for each other, so in fact G, H, and I might all finish before either E or F finish, or before they even start executing. Also note that job dependencies cannot be circular. We wouldn't want job X to depend on Y if Y also depends back on X, because then both jobs would wait for each other forever, neither ever executing. Fortunately, the job system API makes it impossible to schedule circular dependencies, so it's not really a problem. As mentioned, a job should not perform I.O., but furthermore, it should not access any managed objects, and it should only access the data explicitly handed to it. Because it can't perform I.O. or touch managed objects, the only way a job can do useful work is by mutating one or more natively allocated data structures called native containers. For example, if the purpose of a job is to calculate a single number, we create a native array of length 1 and hand the array to the job before scheduling it. In the job, we store the calculated number in the single slot of the array, and after the job finishes, we can read the result from the array. It is these native containers that might be shared between jobs and so might cause scheduling conflicts. To avoid one job interfering with the work of another concurrently scheduled job that accesses the same native container, one job must depend upon the other, directly or indirectly. Which job should be a dependency of the other is up to us, 
but we don't want to leave their order of execution up to the happenstance of scheduling. Very helpfully, the job system safety checks will give us an error if we try to schedule conflicting jobs with no dependency between them. However, these checks are fairly costly, and so they are enabled only within the editor, not within standalone builds. The Burst compiler, again, is an optimizing c -sharp compiler that can aggressively utilize SIMD instructions, single instruction, multiple data instructions. This Burst compiler, though, only works on a subset of c -sharp that Unity calls high-performance c -sharp, and it only works on job code. Especially for computation-heavy code, Burst can often yield 2x to 10x performance gains, sometimes even more. While there are no plans to deprecate game objects, the game object pattern tends to structure data and code in a way that is very unfriendly to the CPU cache and so incurs large performance hits. Moreover, the game object pattern entangles data and code together, arguably making both less flexible and harder to reason about. In contrast, the entities and components of ECS lay out data in a sequentially contiguous way that is very cache friendly, and the systems of ECS keep the data and code logically separate. ECS may be used in conjunction with Unity's game objects, or it may be used as a full replacement. At this time, however, many of Unity's features have no ECS equivalents, so creating a full game today using only ECS is not generally practical. So an entity, again, is just a unique integer ID number, and an entity can have associated with it any number of components. For a single component type, however, a single entity can have only one instance of that type. The set of component types associated with an entity is called its archetype. Like the columns of a relational table, there's no sense of order to the components. So say, an archetype consisting of components A, B, and C is the same as an archetype of components C, B, and A, or B, A, and C, etc. Order doesn't matter. While there is no hard size limit, it's generally best to keep component types small, say under 100 bytes. So rather than bundle many fields into a single component type, it's usually better to split them into very small component types with just a few fields. Unlike game object components, monobehaviors, entity components have no event methods like update. While we can give our components whatever methods we like, it's generally best to instead put most game logic in systems. Unlike game objects, entities do not have parents or children. However, components can have entity IDs as fields, so in this way, an entity can reference other entities through its components. The key to understanding ECS is to understand how it stores the entities and their components in memory. A chunk is a 16 kilobyte block of natively allocated memory that stores some number of entities with the same archetype. In this diagram, for example, we have a chunk storing entities with components A, B, and C. The chunk is split into four parallel arrays, the first for storing the entity IDs, the second for storing the A components, the third for storing the B components, and the fourth for storing the C components. Because components come in different sizes, the number of entities that can be stored in a chunk varies. Be clear though that while the arrays of a chunk may take up different amounts of space, they all have the same number of slots. The first slot of the arrays stores the entity ID and components of the first entity. The second slot stores the entity ID and components of the second entity, etc. The chunk also has a header with information about the chunk, including the count of entities currently stored in the chunk. If a single chunk is not enough to hold all the entities of a particular archetype, additional chunks are created. Because a single chunk can only store entities of one particular archetype, when we change an entity's archetype by adding or removing components, the entity must be moved to a different chunk that matches the entity's new archetype. The entities in a chunk are meant to be stored contiguously with no gaps, so when an entity is removed from a chunk, the last entity in the chunk is moved up to fill in the gap. So that's how entities and their components are stored. What this structure optimizes for is scenarios where we want to loop through all entities with a particular set of components. For example, if we want to do something with all entities having an A and B component, then we loop over all chunks which include those component types, and for each chunk we can loop over the entity ID and A and B components of the entities in that chunk. 
Ideally, this data would all be laid out in memory sequentially in one big array, but the chunk structure of ECS is very close to this ideal. Assuming our query matches multiple chunks, yes, we do have to jump between chunks, and the data within the chunks is split across separate arrays, but as long as we access only a few components in the loop, we still get near optimal memory access. Unlike with the game object structure, our data is not scattered everywhere throughout memory, and we waste very little memory bandwidth accessing data which we don't actually need in the loop. Here, for example, say each box represents a chunk and each letter denotes a component type of that chunk. The chunks themselves may be scattered all throughout memory, but the entity IDs and components within the chunks are stored tightly packed one after the other. If we want to loop through all entities with both B and C components, we touch these five chunks. In other cases, we might want to access entities with a certain set of components, but not access necessarily all of those components. Here, for example, we're still visiting every entity with both B and C components, but we're only accessing the C components. In still other cases, we might want to access entities with a certain set of components that excludes one or more component types. Here, if we want to access the chunks that include B and C, but exclude A, then we would access just these three chunks. A system, concretely, is a class inheriting from component system. Like a mono behavior, systems have event methods called in the game loop. On an update, for example, is called once per frame. Unlike mono behaviors, we don't attach systems to any game objects. We can group systems and use attributes to determine their order of updates, but where unspecified, the order of updates is left up to Unity. What Unity calls a world is comprised of a set of systems and an entity manager, which keeps track of the world's entities. The systems of a world normally only access the entities of their own world. While many games may have no need for more than one world, splitting entities into separate worlds can be useful for various purposes, such as networking. We can access entities and their components in jobs using special job types, but two concurrently scheduled jobs will conflict if they access the same entity components. To fix such conflicts between two jobs, one job must be scheduled as a dependency of the other to ensure that one finishes executing before the other starts. Safety checks in the editor will catch these conflicts if we fail to set up needed dependencies. To help us chain the appropriate dependencies between jobs, we use a variant of component system called job component system. While we can read and mutate entity components within jobs, we cannot, in a job, make structural changes to the chunks, meaning we can't add or remove entities or components. Allowing such structural changes in jobs would create too many potential conflicts. To work around this limitation, a job can record changes it wants made with an entity command buffer, and after the job finishes, the recorded changes of the buffer can then be actually enacted. Rather than directly create entities and components in the Unity editor, we still in ECS create scenes composed of conventional game objects, but using special conversion systems, we can convert the game objects of subscenes into entities when a scene loads. After conversion, the game objects are then usually destroyed. A component with no data is called a tag because such components can be used to tag entities. For example, if we want only some objects to be affected by gravity, we might give only those entities a gravity tag. When we then apply gravity to entities in our code, we only query for entities with this gravity tag. Even though tag components take up no storage space, they are still part of an entity's archetype. So when we add or remove a tag component, the entity must be moved to another chunk, just like for any other change to the archetype. An object component is a special kind of component that is a managed object. These components are not stored in the chunks, but rather in external arrays, and chunks reference the objects by indexes. Because these objects are managed, they cannot be accessed in jobs. While sometimes convenient, object components are not cache friendly, and so using too many object components defeats the whole purpose of ECS. A chunk component is, as the name implies, a component that belongs to a chunk itself, not any individual entity. When entities are added into chunks or moved between chunks, 
no chunk component values are affected. Chunk components are useful in a few niche scenarios. For example, a Colling system might store a chunk component, which is an access aligned bounding box, encompassing the bounding boxes of all the entities within the chunk. This bounding box must be updated as the bounding boxes of the entities change, but keeping this chunk bounding box up to date can speed up Colling calculations. Shared components, like chunk components, only have one value per chunk, not one value per entity. But these shared components logically belong to the individual entities, not the chunk. So when we change the shared component value of an entity, it no longer matches the value of other entities in the same chunk, and therefore the entity must be moved to a different chunk that shares the same new value. If no such chunk already exists, a new chunk is created. Also, like object components, the shared components are not stored in the chunk, but rather in arrays outside of the chunks. The chunk itself, for each entity, simply stores an index into the arrays. The other special thing about these shared components is that unique shared component values are stored only once. So entities across all chunks that share a value all reference the very same value, not any copies. This means that for each unique shared component value, at least one chunk is required. If we have 100 different entities of the same archetype, each with a different shared component value, then each one will be stored in its own chunk. Consequently, shared components are generally only appropriate when we expect many entities to share the same values. Otherwise, our data will get scattered throughout memory, defeating the whole purpose of ECS. While regular components cannot contain arrays, we can give our entities dynamic buffer components. These dynamic buffers are expandable arrays. For each dynamic buffer component of each entity, the chunk stores a fixed size array, but these arrays can be supplemented with additional storage outside the chunk. For example, an entity might have a dynamic buffer component with five fixed slots stored directly in the chunk, but we can expand the array to have, say, 12 slots in which case seven additional slots are allocated outside the chunk. System state components are like regular components, except for one difference. When an entity with any system state components is destroyed, all non-system state components get removed, but the entity is not actually destroyed. Only once we remove all of the system state components does the entity actually get destroyed. The primary use case of system state components is that we might want to do some kind of cleanup work after destroying entities. If we put any data needed for cleanup in system state components of an entity, then we can find the entity for cleanup by querying for all entities with only those system state components. We then perform our cleanup and remove the system state components to actually destroy the entities. The term blob is an acronym for binary large object. A blob asset in ECS is not actually an asset in the usual Unity sense. Blob assets are not necessarily stored as files, and currently they aren't imported into the asset database, though perhaps this might change in the future. Instead, blob assets are simply immutable blobs created in memory that can be referenced from components. Because they're immutable, they can be safely used in jobs without any concern for conflicts. While these blobs cannot contain any absolute pointers, i.e. memory addresses, they can contain relative pointers, i.e. offsets. Because these blobs contain no absolute pointers, the blobs can be trivially serialized and deserialized by simply copying the bytes verbatim. So these blobs are assets in the sense that we might store them on disk at build time and then load them from disk at runtime. Strings can't be stored directly in regular components, but one workaround is to have components reference blobs, which store the needed string data. Blob assets are useful for myriad other kinds of data, such as collision geometry or AI navigation graphs, or whatever else we can think of that fits the format. Understand though that not all binary data formats can be expressed as blob assets. For example, we could store textured data in a blob asset, but most standard texture formats have very particular binary formats that don't conform to the blob asset format, so we can't have the GPU directly load and render textures that are stored in blob assets. So that covers all the major elements of ECS, but again note that for most games, 
ECS is not yet truly viable as a full replacement for game objects. Most of the core Unity engine functionality of game object components as of yet has no ECS equivalent, and so if you use ECS today, you yourself would have to implement this functionality or use conventional game objects alongside ECS. The only major pieces in place right now are three packages, hybrid.rendering, unity.transforms, and unity.physics, all of which are still currently under development. ECS feature parity with conventional game objects is at least a few years away. Lastly, Project Tiny, which we mentioned at the beginning, is a new runtime that strips out everything but support for dots. Because the runtime doesn't support game objects, all conversion of game objects to entities must be done at build time rather than runtime. Like ECS itself, Project Tiny is still currently under heavy development. The project's emphasis for now is on web and mobile games because they would most benefit from smaller download sizes and faster load times. The Unity job system enables us to utilize multiple cores in our game code, but without the usual headaches of writing multi-threaded code. In this video, I'll discuss only the job system and not ECS, which is independent of the job system, though highly complementary when used in conjunction. When we write multi-threaded code without the job system, we're required to create and manage threads ourselves, as well as to manually synchronize access to data that is shared between the threads. When using the job system, it creates and manages a pool of threads for us, usually one per CPU core. We then create units of work called jobs and add them to the job system queue. The job system then farms these jobs from the queue to the pool of threads as the threads become available. It's left up to the job system to decide precisely which jobs run on which threads in what order, and once a job is running on a thread, it is never preempted by other jobs. While a job runs, its thread is occupied until the job finishes. For primarily this reason, the job system is not appropriate for doing I.O. work. If a job were to wait for I.O., its thread would be wastefully idle during that time, thwarting our goal of maximizing utilization of the cores. So, jobs are intended only for doing computation upon in-memory data. Now, it may sometimes be the case that two or more concurrently scheduled jobs access the same shared data. If the shared data is only read, this is not a problem, but if one or more of the jobs mutate the data, we usually then want to ensure these jobs run in a certain order and not overlap in their execution. We can do this in the job system by specifying dependencies between the jobs. If we tell the job system that job A is dependent upon job B, then the job system will make sure job B finishes executing before job A starts. A single job can have multiple direct dependencies, and those dependencies can have their own dependencies. However many dependencies, a job will not start executing until all of its dependencies have finished. So the general idea is that by splitting our workload into separate jobs and creating dependencies between them only where needed, we can maximize the utilization of the cores. But how do we create and schedule jobs? Well, a job is represented as a struct that implements the iJob interface, which has a single method execute. When a job is run, its execute method is called, and when execute returns, the job has finished. Alternatively, a job struct could instead implement iJob parallel 4, which we'll discuss later. When a job is run, it's usually run in a native thread, meaning a thread unmanaged by the garbage collector. Just before calling execute, the job struct is copied, and the job is meant to access only this private copy of the struct, not any other data. Accessing managed objects from a native thread is dangerous because it might interfere with garbage collection. So as a rule, a job struct can only have fields which are blittable types or which are native container types. What C-sharp calls a blittable type is a data type which can be simply copied byte by byte between managed code and native code. Non-blittable types, in contrast, would require extra steps, mainly fixing up references so as not to interfere with garbage collection. The basic number types, like ints and floats, are blittable, but not chars or bools. One-dimensional arrays of blittable types are themselves blittable, as are structs that contain only blittable fields. However, class instances and any managed objects are not blittable, so we cannot include them in our jobs. Unity provides a set of native container types, which are not technically blittable, but a special allowance is made for them in jobs. The native container types include native arrays, 
native hash maps, and a few other basic data structures that cover most common use cases. You can implement your own native container types if the stock set is inadequate. What a native container is, is a struct type with a pointer to natively allocated memory where the actual content is stored. A native array, for example, is a struct with a pointer to natively allocated memory, and the contents of the array, the elements of the array, are stored in that native memory. Because the garbage collector has no awareness of the natively allocated memory, it is our responsibility to deallocate the memory by calling the native container's dispose method when we no longer need it. When creating a native container, we specify one of three options for how to allocate the memory. The persistent option allocates using malloc, meaning an actual system call might get triggered and thus be quite slow. The temp and temp job options allocate from pre-malloc to chunks of memory and so are generally faster, but they are not intended for long living allocations. A temp allocated native container will throw an exception if it is not disposed in the same frame as which it was allocated. A temp job allocated native container will throw an exception if it is not disposed within four frames of being allocated. Understand, however, that the checks for these exceptions are fairly expensive and so run in the editor, but disabled in standalone builds of the game. Regardless, you should always respect the intended allocation lifetime limits. Now, if a job can't perform I.O. or access any data other than its own fields, the only way a job can do useful work is by mutating one or more of its native container fields. Although a job effectively accesses its own private copy of the struct, when the native container fields are copied, their pointers still point to the same underlying memory. Thus, mutations of native containers in a job are visible outside the job. For example, if the purpose of a job is to calculate a single number, we create a native array of length 1 and set the array as the field of the job before scheduling it. In the job, we store the calculated number in the single slot of the array, and after the job finishes, we can read the result from the array. Once we've created a job struct, we then put the job on the queue by calling the schedule extension method, which returns a job handle. Passing job handles to schedule makes them direct dependencies of the newly scheduled job. Because we need the handle of a job to use it as a dependency, the job must already be scheduled, and so it's effectively impossible to create circular dependencies. We can't make job A a dependency of job B while also making job B a dependency of A. And we wouldn't want to do so because then both jobs would be deadlocked, waiting on each other forever to start running. Having scheduled a job, at some point we'll want to make sure that it has finished. That's when we call the complete method on the job handle. Complete those three things. First, complete marks jobs as ready for execution. When a job is scheduled, it will not be executed until it's marked ready. As we'll show later, you can also ready jobs by calling the schedule batched job method. Second, complete will not return until the job has finished executing. If the job happens to have already finished, complete will return immediately, but otherwise it will wait. Now, jobs usually run on background worker threads, but when we call complete, it may be the case that the job or its dependencies have not yet started execution. In such cases, the job system may elect to run the jobs on the main thread, rather than letting the main thread wastefully sit idle. Third, complete removes all reference to the job from the queue. Forgetting to complete a job effectively creates a resource leak, because the record of the job otherwise won't get removed from the queue. Two more important notes on complete. If a job has already been completed, subsequent calls to complete do nothing. Also, completing a job first completes its dependencies and all of their dependencies recursively. So, having created and scheduled a long chain of dependencies, you need only complete the root of the chain rather than complete each job in the chain individually. So finally, here is a simple example of creating, scheduling, and completing a job. The example is very artificial, but demonstrates the steps. At the bottom, we have defined a struct called myJob. It implements the iJob interface and so has an execute method that takes no arguments and returns void. This simple job has just one field, a native array of ints, and in the execute method, the job simply increments the value at index 4 of the array. Above, in the start method of Amana behavior, we're creating a native array of 5 ints, assigning the value 99 to its index 4, and incrementing that value. So when we print it out immediately after, it has the value 100. We then create a myJob instance, assigning the native array to its single field, schedule the job, and then call complete on the returned job handle. 
The call to complete readies the job for execution. It is then executed, incrementing the value in the array. And when complete returns, all record of the job has been removed from the queue, and we can be sure that it has finished executing. When we next print out the value in index 4 of the array, it is now 101. Having completed this job, we don't need the array anymore, so we dispose of it. Note that we chose to use the persistent allocator here, but we could just as well have used the temp or temp job allocators. Generally for jobs, we prefer to use temp job rather than temp, and we only use persistent for jobs that run over many frames. Also note that this job requires a native array of at least five ints. When we run in the editor, an exception is thrown if we access an array out of bounds, and so we would get an exception here if the array of the job had fewer than five ints. However, no bounds checks are performed in standalone builds, and so this code would dangerously access memory outside the bounds of the array, given an array with fewer than five ints. In this next example, our job struct at the bottom now has an additional int field called val, and the execute code multiplies index zero of the array by val. Above in the start method, this time the array has just one int and is allocated with temp job. We assign three to the single int of the array and create two instances of my job. Both jobs are assigned the same array, but the first is given two for its val and the second is given five for its val. Because the first job is completed before the second is scheduled, the first job will always finish before the second starts. When the first job runs, three in the array is multiplied by two, giving us six, and then when the second job runs, six is multiplied by five, giving us 30. So after completing the second job, the value stored in the array is 30. If though, we try scheduling both jobs before completing either, we'll get an exception running the game in the editor when we try to schedule the second job. The job system safety checks notice that the second job uses the same native array as another job that's already sitting on the queue, and neither job is a dependency of the other. If the job system allowed this, it would be dangerously indeterminate which job ran before the other, and the jobs could also dangerously run at the same time. For jobs that share mutating data, we almost always want to ensure that they run in a set sequence. In this case, if the second job were to run before the first, we'd get the same result 30 because multiplication is associative, but in many other cases, ordering jobs differently would produce different results. To make the job system happy here, we should make the first job a dependency of the second. The safety checks then won't throw an exception, and the job system will ensure that the first job finishes execution before the second begins. And thanks to the dependency, we need only explicitly complete the second job, because doing so first transitively completes its dependency, the first job. It's also the case that, while a job sits on the queue, we shouldn't access any of its native containers in the main thread, and in the editor, safety checks will throw an exception if you do so. Here, only once the job has been completed and so removed from the queue, should the main thread again access this native array. To make this code correct, the main thread would only access the array after the job has been completed, not before. As a rule, jobs should only be scheduled and completed on the main thread. Though scheduling and completing jobs within other jobs might seem useful in some scenarios, it was decided that allowing either would be too error-prone and would create too many complications. As a guideline, it's generally best to schedule jobs as soon as we can, and then wait to complete them only when we absolutely need them completed. In our examples so far, we've completed jobs right after scheduling them, but this tends to defeat our goal of maximizing utilization of the CPU cores. More realistically and more typically, we often want to schedule jobs at the start of a frame and then only complete them at the end of the same frame. In this example, we're scheduling a job in the update method, but then waiting to complete the job in late update, which runs after all updates of every mono behavior. In other cases, we may even want to complete a job in a later frame, allowing the job's workload to be spread across multiple frames. As mentioned, there's no possible logical conflict between jobs if the data they share is only read and not written. So, we can mark native container fields of a job with the read-only attribute. The job system will then not consider it a conflict to schedule multiple unrelated jobs that only read from the same native container. Without this attribute, we would be required to make the jobs dependencies of each other, meaning their executions couldn't run in parallel. When running in the editor, Safety checks will throw an exception if we modify a read-only native container. 
In this example, the input array is marked read-only, and so mutating its contents triggers an exception. Sometimes we might want to complete multiple jobs at the same point, but calling complete on one job after the other may force them to run in an order that makes suboptimal use of the CPU cores. By instead using the complete all method, we can wait for multiple jobs to complete, but allow the job system to choose an order of completion that may be more optimal. The schedule method only accepts one job handle as a dependency, so to give a job multiple direct dependencies, we need the combined dependencies method, which combines multiple handles into one virtual handle. The combined handle here doesn't represent an actual job, but if we schedule a job with this combined handle as the dependency, then the new job would wait for A, B, and C to all finish execution before it starts. And be clear that A, B, and C do not have to be dependencies of each other, and so they can still run in parallel with each other. The IJob parallel 4 interface is like IJob, but the execute method has an int parameter. When we schedule an IJob parallel 4, we specify a count and a batch size. Behind the scenes, the job is split into subjobs, each of which calls execute with a different range of indexes. Here, for example, the count is 100 and the batch size is 20, so the job is split into five subjobs. These subjobs are individually taken off the queue and executed like normal jobs. The first subjob calls execute 20 times with indexes 0 through 19. The second subjob also calls execute 20 times, but with indexes 20 through 39. The third subjob also calls execute 20 times, but with indexes 40 through 59, and so forth for the other subjobs. Now, understand the count need not be evenly divisible by the batch size, in which case the last subjob will make fewer execute calls than the other subjobs. However, the work is split across however many subjobs, the job is only considered finished once all of its subjobs have finished. What a parallel for job effectively allows us to do is conveniently split a workload across multiple jobs while only explicitly creating and scheduling one job. This example increments all 100 indexes of the array, splitting the work across five subjobs that can run in parallel on separate cores. Note that the array is effectively split into subranges, one for each subjob, and it would be improper for a subjob to access indexes of the array outside its own subrange. In fact, the job really shouldn't access any index of the array other than the one passed to the int parameter. Now, you might be concerned that a regular job has a single call to execute, but a parallel for can have many, and those many method calls may induce a lot of overhead. Well, this is not actually really a concern, because the overhead gets optimized away by the compiler. Speaking of compilers, lastly here, another feature of Unity's data-oriented technology stack is the Burst compiler, Unity's special optimizing c -sharp compiler that can aggressively utilize SIMD instructions. SIMD, S-I-M-D, stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data, and these are instructions in modern CPUs that perform operations en masse, particularly math operations on floating point values. A typical SIMD instruction might say multiply four pairs of floating point numbers, and it does so in significantly fewer CPU cycles than if you were to multiply the four pairs individually using regular instructions. Unity's regular c -sharp compiler, the Mono compiler, is not very aggressive about utilizing SIMD instructions because of certain design choices in c -sharp. The Burst compiler, though, only works on a subset of c -sharp that Unity calls high-performance c -sharp, and the Burst compiler only works on job code. So by moving your workloads into jobs and sticking to this subset of c -sharp, you can then take advantage of the Burst compiler, which often yields performance gains in the range of 2x to 10x or even more sometimes. It's about as close as you're going to get to free performance. Currently, Burst is only available in Preview as an optional package in the Package Manager, and once installed, you enable Burst compilation on each job with the Burst compile attribute. Burst does not yet support debugging, so you'll need to disable Burst compilation if you want to debug a job. There's not much you really need to know about Burst to use it, but I'll cover more details in a later video. ECS is an architectural pattern consisting of entities, components, and systems. An entity is a logical ID associated with any number of components, which are simply data elements. A system, meanwhile, is a unit of code that's executed in the game loop. Unity's ECS may be used in conjunction with Unity's game objects, or it may be used as a full replacement. 
At this time, however, many of Unity's features have no ECS equivalents, so creating a full game today using only ECS is not generally practical. While there are no plans to deprecate game objects, game objects suffer from a few key problems that ECS means to address. This is covered at length in many other videos about Unity ECS, but very briefly, the game object pattern tends to structure data and code in a way that is very unfriendly to the CPU cache and so incurs large performance hits. Moreover, the game object pattern entangles data and code together, arguably making both less flexible and harder to reason about. In contrast, the entities and components of ECS lay out data in a sequentially contiguous way that is very cache friendly, and the systems of ECS keep the data and code logically separate. So an entity, again, is just a unique integer ID number, but to allow ID numbers to be reused for new entities once existing entities are destroyed, each entity also has a version number. Each time an ID number is reused, the version number is incremented. For example, the first entity created in a game will have the ID number 0 and version number 0. If we destroy this entity, an entity created later that reuses ID number 0 will have version number 1. An entity can have associated with it any number of components, but it cannot have multiple components of the same type. The set of component types associated with an entity is called its archetype, and like the columns of a relational table, there's no sense of order to the components. An archetype of component types A, B, and C is the same as an archetype of component types C, B, and A, or B, A, and C, etc. A component type is defined as a struct which implements interface I component data. This interface has no methods, it simply marks a struct as a component type. The struct must be blittable, which in short means that it cannot have any reference type fields, including strings. While there is no hard size limit, it's generally best to keep component types small, say under 100 bytes. So rather than bundle many fields into a single component type, it's usually better to split them into very small component types with just a few fields. Unlike monobehavior components, entity components have no event methods like update, and while we can give our component structs whatever methods we like, it's generally best to instead put most game logic in systems. Unlike game objects, entities do not have parents or children. However, components can have entity IDs as fields, so in this way, entities can be logically related to each other through their components. A system is a class inheriting from component system. Like a monobehavior, systems have event methods called in the game loop. On update is called once per frame, on create is called once upon the system's creation, on destroy is called when the system is destroyed, on start running is called before the first on update and again when the system resumes after being stopped or disabled, on stop running is called when the system is stopped or disabled. The order of updates among all the systems is decided by Unity, but we can use attributes to ensure that a system updates before or after other particular systems. A system also keeps track of entity queries, as we'll discuss later, and when no entities match its queries, its update method is skipped. A world is a set of entities and systems. A world's entity manager keeps track of the entities, and the systems of a world normally only access the entities of their own world. The systems within a world are organized into a hierarchy of groups, and system updates can be ordered relative to these groups. While many games may have no need for more than one world, splitting entities into separate worlds can be useful for simulation and networking. A default world is automatically created on launch, and instances of all the component systems in your project get automatically added to this world. This default behavior can be disabled, and worlds can be created explicitly, but the API for this is currently underdeveloped, so I won't cover it here. The key to understanding ECS is to understand how it stores the entities and their components. A chunk is a 16 kilobyte block of natively allocated memory that stores some number of entities with the same archetype. In this diagram, for example, we have a chunk storing entities with components of types A, B, and C. The chunk then is split into four parallel arrays, the first for storing the entity IDs, the second for storing the A components, the third for storing the B components, and the fourth for storing the C components. Because components come in different sizes, the number of entities that can be stored in a chunk varies. Also, these arrays that make up a single chunk may take up different amounts of space, but they all have the same number of slots. 
The first slot of each array stores the entity ID and components of the first entity. The second slot stores the entity ID and components of the second entity, etc. The chunk also has a header with information about the chunk, including the count of entities currently stored in it. When a single chunk is not enough to hold all the entities of a particular archetype, additional chunks are created. In our code, we use a world's entity manager to create and destroy entities and to add, remove, and set their components, but it's the entity manager that handles the details of creating and managing the chunks. Adding or removing components of an entity changes its archetype, and because a chunk can only store entities of one archetype, the entity must be moved to a different chunk with the matching archetype. The entities in a chunk are meant to be stored contiguously with no gaps, so when an entity is removed from a chunk, the last entity in the chunk is moved to fill in the gap. In addition to the chunks, the entity manager tracks the existing entities in an entity data array. Each slot index corresponds to an entity ID, and each slot stores the entity's version number, a pointer to its chunk, the index of the entity within the chunk, and a pointer to its archetype. This array starts out small and grows as needed, and free slots of the array are tracked in another structure. So that's how ECS stores its data. What this structure optimizes for is scenarios where we want to loop through all entities with a particular set of components. For example, if we want to do something with all entities having an A and B component, then we loop over all chunks which include those component types, and for each chunk, we can loop over the entity IDs and A and B components of the entities in that chunk. Ideally, this data would all be laid out in memory sequentially in one big array, but the chunk structure of ECS is very close to this ideal. Assuming our query matches multiple chunks, yes, we do have to jump between chunks, and the data within the chunks is split across separate arrays, but as long as we access only a few components in the loop, we still get near optimal memory access. Unlike with the game object structure, our data is not scattered everywhere throughout memory, and we waste very little memory bandwidth accessing data we don't actually need in our loop. So now, looking at the actual API, how do we create and destroy entities? Well, we need a world's entity manager, and here we'll use the default active world. Note also that we're writing the code in a mono behavior for now, but we'll later use a system instead. With the entity manager here, the first create entity call here creates a new entity with no components, returning an entity struct, which simply contains two integers, the ID number and the version number of the newly created entity. We then call add component twice to give this entity two components. The comp A type is defined above to have a single int field X, and the comp B type is defined to have two float fields X and Y. Calling remove component removes the comp A component, and lastly, we destroy the entity by calling destroy entity. Be clear that each time we add or remove a component, we're changing the entity's archetype, and so it gets moved to a different chunk each time. Consequently, it's most efficient to create an entity with a set of component types specified up front. We can do this by passing component types to create entity, or by calling instantiate, which creates a new entity with the same component types as an existing entity and copies its component values. Once we've created entities and given them components, we can get and set individual components with the getComponentData and setComponentData methods. When components are first added, they have default values, which is zero for number fields, so the X field of the compa struct here has the value zero when it's printed out. We then set its value to five and set the component with this new value. When we create many entities, it's generally more performant and more convenient to first create archetypes and then pass these archetypes to create entities. Here at the top, we've defined an archetype with types comp A and comp B, and then we create an entity with this archetype. When we pass this array of 10 entity structs to create entity, it creates 10 entities with this archetype and populates the array with the new entity's IDs. We can also do likewise with instantiate to create multiple copies of an existing entity. Passing an array of entity structs to destroy entity destroys multiple entities in one call. We can also create entities explicitly in new chunks with create chunk by passing in an array of archetype chunks. This call here creates 200 new entities, all stored in new chunks, and the archetype chunk values representing those chunks are stored in the array. 
Just remember that, having created these native arrays, we are responsible for disposing of them when we no longer need them. As a special case, if a component type has no fields, it takes up no storage space in the chunks. We call these component types tags because they can be used to tag enemies. For example, if we want only some objects to be affected by gravity, we might give only those entities a gravity tag. Then in our code, when we loop through the entities to apply gravity, we query only for entities with this gravity tag. Even though tag components take up no space, they are still part of an entity's archetype, so when you add or remove a tag component, the entity must be moved to another chunk, just like for any other change to its archetype. Though generally useful only for debugging purposes, we can get all the entities or all of the chunks from an entity manager. The get all entities and get all chunks methods return native arrays, which we must dispose of when we no longer need them. We can get the chunk an entity is stored in by calling get chunk, and then we can iterate through all of its entity IDs and components. We call archetype chunk component type to get a value representing that component type. Passing true instead of false would indicate we want read only access. In this case, though, we want write access. We also call archetype chunk entity to get a value representing the entity field of the array. We then call the chunks get native array method, passing in these type values to get the arrays that make up the chunk. Be clear that these are not newly created arrays, but rather the actual underlying arrays that make up the chunk, and so we should not dispose of them. These arrays should only be disposed by the entity manager when the chunk itself is disposed, and that too is under the control of the entity manager. Anyway, now that we have these arrays, we can loop through them in parallel. We can mutate the component values, but be clear that the square brackets operator returns a struct copy not the struct itself stored in the array. Consequently, we must assign the mutated struct value back to the same index to actually mutate the component. Here, we retrieve the comp a component, set its x field to 4, and then assign the mutated component back to the same index. If we want to find all chunks matching certain criteria, we can create an entity query. The createEntityQuery method takes component types as arguments, and returns an entity query object from which we can retrieve a native array of chunks that match the query criteria by calling create archetype chunk array. We must specify which allocator to use, and we are responsible for disposing of this chunk when we no longer need it. Once we have the array of chunks, we can iterate through every chunk and also iterate through their entities like we did in the previous example. In this example, our query matches all chunks that include components of type comp A and comp B, and when we loop over the entities of each chunk, we are mutating the comp B values. Notice that for the query, we declared comp B to be read only, but when we called get archetype chunk component type, we specified false, meaning not read only. In this context, it's just the latter that governs whether we can mutate the array, and so it's okay that we mutate the comp B values here. Later though, when we access components in jobs, the query's read-only constraint will have significance. Rather than access the chunks directly, we could also copy from a query's matching chunks all of the entity IDs and component values into new arrays. Here, the query's toEntityArray method returns an array with all of the entity values, and the query's toComponentArray method returns an array with all of the comp B values. In the loop, when we modify the comp B values in the array, we are not modifying the actual chunk data, only the copy in this array. Once we're done with these arrays, we must dispose of them. Also note that because these methods internally copy the data in jobs, we cannot use the temp allocator, which is not allowed in jobs. We can only use the temp job or persistent allocators. A query can also be created from an entity query desk, desk is in description, which has three arrays of component types. The all array specifies component types which matching chunks must have. The any array specifies component types which matching chunks must have at least one of. And the none array specifies component types which matching chunks must not have. In this example, the query matches chunks which have component types comp A and comp B, but chunks which also have at least one of comp C or comp D or both and which do not have either comp E or comp F. 
When we access a chunk, we can use the has method to test whether it includes any component type, thus in effect allowing us to access optional components of our query when they are present. Because all entities in a chunk have the same archetype, we need only check for a particular optional component type once per chunk, not per entity. In Unity ECS, a system is a class inheriting from component system, and we can override its event methods, which include onCreate, onDestroy, and onUpdate. The update method is called once per frame, and we can use attributes to specify when the updates are performed relative to updates of other systems. In this example of my system, the attribute says that it should update before other system, and other system, meanwhile, says that it should update after my system. These attributes are, of course, logically redundant, so we only need one of them. If, though, we were to specify a logically impossible order, like both updating before the other, Unity will throw an exception upon the creation of these systems. In cases where we don't specify which of two systems should update before the other, Unity picks the order for us. In general, we should leave the update order unspecified, except where we really need this control. The systems of a world are placed into logical groups. When a group updates, all of its systems update. We can create whatever groups we like, and we can create subgroups within groups, but three groups are created by default, an initialization system group, a simulation system group, and a presentation system group, which are updated in that order. In this example, both systems are explicitly added into the simulation system group, which is actually the default. In the editor, looking at the entity debugger window, we can see a list of all the systems in their execution order. You can see here the my system and other system, along with other default systems, which we'll discuss later. If we look at the full player loop, you can see where these system group updates execute relative to the mono behavior events. As you can see, the initialization system group is updated just before early update, the simulation system group is updated just after the regular update, and the presentation system group is updated just before post-late update. In a system, we can create and use entity queries like we've already seen, but when we do so, we should create the queries using methods of system itself rather than the entity manager. This is not just more convenient, it allows the system to track which queries are used in the system. A system with no queries will update unconditionally, but as soon as we add at least one query to a system, the system will skip updating when no entities match its queries. Rather than wastefully create an entity query every update, we generally should just create it in the system's onCreate method and reuse it every frame. Be clear though that the chunk and component arrays we get from a query should not themselves live beyond the end of each update because the underlying data may change. An entity query builder provides a more convenient way to iterate over components of a matching archetype. Every system has an entity query builder field named entities, and when we call its foreach method, we pass in a lambda. Using introspection of the lambda parameters, foreach builds an entity query and calls the lambda function once for each entity of the matching chunks. In this example, the query matches chunks with component types comp A and comp B. The lambda function increments x of the comp A value with x of the comp B value, and then it removes the comp B component from the entity. There's quite a bit of magic going on here. For one thing, creating a lambda every update would normally create wasteful garbage, but the Unity compiler specially avoids this. Second, the components are passed as refs so that mutations to the parameters aren't just local to the function. Third, when we mutate the component, we are actually mutating a copy, but when the lambda returns, for each copies these values back to the actual components stored in the chunk. As you can imagine, this arrangement is less optimal than directly iterating over the components in the chunks. The reason for each must make these copies is because creating entities, destroying entities, or adding or removing components are all structural changes. They require modifying the chunk structure or moving entities between chunks. Once we make a structural change, any arrays of chunks or components that we created before the change can no longer be used, even if their data was unaffected. To work around this problem without using for each, we can record the changes we want to make with an entity command buffer and then play back those changes later. These entity command buffers are created from special systems called entity command buffer systems. By default, the buffer created from one of these systems is played back when that system updates. Once played back, an entity command buffer cannot be used again, so we generally need to create new buffers every frame. 
In this example, we first get the end simulation entity command buffer system, which is created by default and is updated last in the simulation system group. From the system, we create an entity command buffer, which has most of the same methods as an entity manager. Here, we use the buffer to create an entity and add a component, but the changes are not enacted until we call playback, passing in the entity manager. It's an error to call playback more than once on the same buffer, and so to prevent the end simulation entity command buffer system from calling playback like it normally would, we set should playback on the buffer to false. The iBuffer element data interface defines a component type that stores an array of values rather than a single struct. These arrays have a fixed number of slots that are stored directly in the chunk, but these arrays can grow by storing any number of additional slots outside the chunk, hence these are called dynamic buffer components. In this example, we define an iBuffer element data called myBufferElement with two int fields. The internal buffer capacity attribute specifies that dynamic buffer components of this type will store five of these elements directly in the chunk for each entity. Along with the five elements, the component stores a length and a pointer. When the component's capacity of five is exceeded, more memory is allocated outside the chunk, and the pointer is set to point to this memory. So in code, we add a dynamic buffer component to an existing entity using the addBuffer method, or we include the component upon an entity's creation. We use getBuffer to retrieve a dynamic buffer from an entity, and we can add elements to the buffer with the add method. Note that after adding one element, the length is one because it started out at zero, even though the internal capacity of the buffer is five. If we were to add more than five elements to the buffer, the extra elements would be stored outside the chunk. Also note that when we retrieve a value from the buffer, we are getting a copy of the struct, so here to actually mutate the buffer, the element must be assigned back to the same index. Finally, when we remove the element at a given index, all elements following it are shifted to fill in the gap. When working with chunks, we can access the dynamic buffer components much like we do for regular components, except we call getBufferAccessor passing in an archetype chunk buffer type. To access entities and their components in jobs, we use special job types and we use job component systems to help us chain appropriate dependencies between our jobs. An iJob chunk iterates through chunks of a query, processing each chunk in its own subjob. An iJob for each iterates through entities of a query, optionally processing the entities in multiple subjobs. The iJob for each with entity does the same, but accesses the entity IDs as well as the components. In this example, we define an iJob chunk, which accesses the comp A and comp B components of the chunk. The execute method receives three parameters. The first parameter receives the chunk. The second parameter, chunk index, receives a value that should be used in conjunction with concurrent entity command buffers, as we'll explain later. And the third parameter receives the cumulative count of entities in all chunks with smaller indexes. For example, if the chunk at index 0 has 20 entities and the chunk at index 1 has 30 entities, then the first entity index value for the first three chunks will be 0, 20, and 50, respectively. Anyway, this parameter is not really useful in most cases, but I mention it for completeness. To use this job, we assign it archetype chunk component types to its fields, and we call schedule, passing in a query which determines which chunks the job will process. When the job runs, execute is called once per chunk, and each execute call runs as its own subjob. Only once all the chunks have been processed is the job finished. Much like how the job system safety checks ensure that no two concurrently scheduled jobs access the same native container unless the access of both is read-only, the job system safety checks also ensure that no two concurrently scheduled jobs access the same entity components unless the access of both is read-only. So here, if we schedule another instance of my job while the first is still scheduled, the safety checks will throw an exception because both jobs access the comp A component in the same chunks. The two jobs conflict, and so we must either complete one job before scheduling the other, or schedule one job as a dependency of the other. Either way, it should be determinant which job always finishes before the other starts. Note that the comp B component is marked read-only in the job, and this is what tells the job system that it's okay to concurrently schedule the job with other jobs that also access comp B as read-only. When we define the archetype chunk component type for comp B, 
we pass Boolean true as the argument, and this makes the component array that getNativeArray returns read only, such that attempting to mutate that array will trigger an exception. So when we want to access a component read only in a job, we effectively should specify that the access is read only in two places, not just one. Job component system is a variant of component system that helps us configure job dependencies across systems. When we use a job component system, we should create queries and archetype chunk component types for our jobs using methods of the job component system rather than the entity manager as we have done so far. Here, for example, we're calling the get entity query and get archetype chunk component type methods of the system, not the entity manager. Creating the query this way registers it with the system, and it is assumed that jobs created in the system will use the queries registered with the system. On updates of job component system expects us to return a single job handle representing all jobs created in the update. So if we create multiple jobs, we should make the jobs dependencies of each other or use the combined dependencies method to combine them into one job handle. The returned handle will be completed for us at some point later, at the very latest before the next update of the same system. Usually though, completion happens upon the next structural change because to avoid conflicts, structural changes trigger a hard sync point. These sync points complete all outstanding jobs that touch entities and components of the same world. The job handle parameter of an update is passed a job handle representing all jobs returned by other job component systems which may conflict with the queries of this system. And so, to avoid conflicts, all the jobs we create in the update should depend upon the input job handle either directly or indirectly. In some scenarios, this does create dependencies that aren't really necessary and thus may create inefficiencies but we can always work around these problems by splitting the jobs created in one system across multiple separate systems. iJob for each is an alternative to iJob chunk that is sometimes more convenient, and despite the name, it doesn't share the performance drawbacks of the entity query builder for each method that we saw earlier. This example implicitly creates a query that matches chunks with both comp A and comp B. The first attribute excludes chunks that have comp X, and the second attribute requires the chunks to also have comp Y, even though we do not access the comp Y components in this job. For each entity, the components we actually access are passed by ref to the execute method, such that mutations to the component parameter directly mutate the component in the chunk. Note here that the comp B parameter is marked read only, so we cannot mutate it. The I job for each with entity variant passes the entity ID to the first parameter of the execute method. If though we want to make structural changes as we iterate through the entities, we must use an entity command buffer like we've seen before, but because the buffer in this job may be used concurrently in separate subjobs, we must use the concurrent form of entity command buffer. Here we see how this job can be created and scheduled. We create an entity command buffer from the end simulation entity command buffer system, but we make it concurrent by calling the to concurrent method. When we schedule the job, we give it the input dependencies of the job component system, like we always should, but notice we pass the system itself as the first argument rather than a query. The schedule method itself uses the system to create the query using introspection information from the job. If instead of the regular schedule we call schedule single, then the job would be processed in one logical subjob rather than split across many in which case we wouldn't need a concurrent entity command buffer because then the buffer would only be used from just one thread. When an entity command buffer is played back, it may make structural changes, but rather than trigger a hard sync that unnecessarily completes jobs unrelated to the changes, entity command buffers only complete jobs that are explicitly registered to require completion before playback. By calling add job handle for producer here, we're telling the entity command buffer that this job must be completed before the buffer playback. Finally, there are a good number of odds and ends I haven't covered here, most of which I may not cover anytime soon because they are still underdocumented and highly subject to change. In some follow-up videos though, I'll walk through some more practical examples and we'll look at some of the packages Unity currently has in development that are related to ECS, including hybrid.rendering, unity.transforms, and unity.physics. This ECS demo uses a hybrid of ECS and the conventional game objects and mono behaviors. 
The player character, the gun, the floor, and the lights are all just conventional game objects. But then the bullets and the enemies are modeled as entities and they're rendered using the hybrid.rendering package. Collision detection between the bullets and the enemies is all done in ECS and then also is a collision check between enemies and the player. And so the player is represented doubly, not just as a game object, but also as an entity. When a bullet hits an enemy, the enemy is destroyed, and in its place, using the conventional game objects and model behaviors, we play a sound and some particle effects. Because these bullet impacts get frequently created, we actually use a pool of bullet impact objects. Otherwise, we'd be creating garbage and also might get some stutters when the bullet impacts are created. So first, looking at the scene hierarchy, we have our player object, which is from a prefab, and it includes the gun as a child. The player itself has a few scripts attached to it, which we'll look at, including these entity conversion scripts, which create at scene start the entity representation of the player. Looking at the camera, it has some cinemachine components, which are responsible for the camera following the player as the player moves around. That's just some off-the-shelf camera logic. This post-processing volume adds a number of standard post-processing effects. The ground is just a flat plane with a mesh collider. I'm not sure why they use a mesh collider where a simple box collider would suffice. They probably made it a mesh collider simply out of convenience. The scene has two directional lights from up above. The main light casts shadows and the other one is just for highlights as the name implies. This game settings object has a script that holds the main global state of the game. The enemy spawner script is what spawns enemies around the player at a regular interval. You can see there's a flag here to disable using ECS so that the enemies are spawned as just conventional game objects. This is here to demonstrate the performance difference, but I'll just leave it checked. And lastly, the bullet impact pool script keeps a pool of bullet impact objects, which are created when bullets hit enemies. Looking back at the player in our player shooting script, we also have an option to disable ECS for spawning the bullets. So that's why in the bullet prefab, it includes a rigid body and a capsule collider, but these both are irrelevant when our bullets are entities. Same deal for the enemy prefab. It has a rigid body and a capsule collider, but when our enemies are entities, these have no bearing. Before looking at any of the system code, we'll look at the mono behavior code. The settings mono behavior holds a little bit of game state and configuration. It has the transform of where the player is currently, as well as the radius for the player and the enemies that we're gonna use in collision detection. This script is treated as a singleton, so it has a static field of its own type, which is supposed to hold the only instance of this mono behavior. It also includes a few helper methods. Like for example, when we spawn enemies, we're gonna spawn them in a random point around the player. So this method returns a random point on the circle that is a radius around the player. The class also keeps track of when the player is dead. So when the player dies, we'll call player died and we'll check for their current state with is player dead. Player movement and look mono behavior handles the input for moving our player. We can move the player horizontally and vertically. And for the player's facing, we cast a ray from the screen and where it collides with the ground, that is the direction the player will face. The script also animates the player given their current direction of movement. If the enemies are game objects rather than entities, then this checks for collision with those enemy objects. And when the player dies, we call this method to set its animation to the proper state. The bullet impact pool has a reference to our bullet hit prefab, and it keeps a pool of 100 game objects. And whether the enemies are game objects or entities, either way, we call this method play bullet impact, specifying where the impact occurs, and that puts a bullet impact object at that location. The enemy behavior script is attached to our enemy prefab, and when the enemies are game objects rather than entities, then this is a logic that handles their movement and collision detection. But when we use entities, this is all irrelevant, and all that matters is this convert method down at the bottom, which is the method for the iConvertGameObjectEntity interface. When this method is called, a new entity has already been created and gets passed in, along with the entity manager of that entity's world. And in the method, we add and set the components to set up the entity equivalent of the game object to which this model behavior is attached. So here, an enemy entity should have the enemy tag component, the move forward component, which is also another tag component, though it doesn't have tag in the name, and then we set a move speed component and a health component. So again, when we use entities, this is all that's really relevant. Now, you might be wondering what this game object conversion system parameter is about. Well, as I explained in a video called Converting Scene Data to Dots, 
for various reasons, conversion of game objects into entities is done with a set of systems, these game object conversion systems. For our purposes here, it's not really relevant, so we can ignore it in this context. Anyway, so when is this convert method called? Well, in the enemy spawner mono behavior, it has an enemy prefab game object field. And in the start method here, when we use ECS, when this flag is true, then we call this game object conversion utility dot convert game object hierarchy, passing in the enemy prefab and specifying which world we want to create it in. This creates an entity and calls the convert method we just saw, and the new entity is returned, which we assign to this other field, enemy entity prefab. Using the entity debugger, we can inspect this entity at runtime. And because this is the second entity created after the game starts, it has entity ID one. In the inspector, you can see that it has the health and move speed and enemy tag and forward tag, like we gave it explicitly in the convert method, but it also has a number of other stuff. Uh, for one thing, this is confusing because the indentation here, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is just a bug. It implies some kind of hierarchy, but for tag components that don't have any data, for whatever reason, it erroneously indents the next component under it when it shouldn't be indented at all. So just imagine this is a straight list. Anyway, where this other stuff comes from is if we look at the enemy prefab from which we converted this entity, it has, say, the mesh renderer component here, and it has a transform component. And that's why its entity conversion has the translation, rotation, local to world matrix, per instance, calling tag and render mesh components. And it also has this prefab tag component because it was converted from a prefab. The prefab component is a special tag that marks the entity as ignored by all systems. So this entity, entity one, is not going to actually render or anything. It's not actually going to be used by any system. We just want to create it so that in our entity spawner, we can create clones of it using the instantiate method. So that's what happens here in the update. Every frame we check if the spawn interval has elapsed, and if so, we get a random position in the radius around the player. If we're not using ECS, then we just instantiate the enemy prefab game object, creating a clone game object. But if we are using ECS, we create a clone of the entity, entity one, and set its translation to this random position. Note that when we clone an entity with instantiate, the clone is a full copy, except it doesn't have the prefab tag and so it will be an active entity used by the systems. The projectile behavior script is attached to the bullet prefab, and like the enemy behavior script, it has a bit of state, but also a rigid body component and some relevant methods, but these are only relevant when our bullets are game objects rather than entities. When our bullets are entities, all that matters is the convert method here, which from the game object instance this is attached to, in this case, the bullet prefab, we create the entity equivalent by giving it the right components. So for our bullets, we give them a move forward component, a move speed, and a time to live. As we'll see later in the system, time to live of every bullet is decremented each frame, and when this value goes below zero, the bullet is destroyed. The bullets are instantiated in the player shooting script, which is attached to the player object. It has a field to store the bullet prefab, and just like in the enemy spawner, we're calling game object conversion utility dot convert game object hierarchy, passing in this bullet prefab. This creates a new entity and passes it to the convert method we just saw, and the entity is returned, which we assign to this field bullet entity prefab. In the update loop, if the player fires, then we spawn some bullets, and if we're using ECS and Spreadshot, as we saw in the demo, then we call this method here, passing in the rotation, the angle the gun's pointing in, and that method down here creates a number of new bullet entities, creating them as clones of the bullet entity prefab we just created in the start method. For the sake of the spreadshot, we go through this loop that gives them different translations and rotations. I'll let you study that logic yourself, but that's how we create the bullets. Looking again in the entity debugger, the third entity created, entity two, is our bullet prefab entity. It has the components we explicitly gave it, which are move speed, time to live, and move forward but it also has these other components derived from certain components of the prefab. And again, note that it has the prefab tag component, so this entity itself is not actually active. We just need this entity so we can make clones when we shoot actual bullets. Now, lastly, before getting into the system code, you'll notice the first entity created is this one called player. This is the entity representation of the player, and it's created by two scripts on the player prefab. Down here, we have player to entity conversion, and convert to entity script. Player to entity conversion is a simple model behavior that implements I convert game object to entity. So it has the convert method that's called when this entity is created. 
and it's this convert to entity script which is actually creating the entity and calling the convert method. This is a standard script in the entity's package. We didn't write it. It gives the entity the debugging name, which is the same as the game object name. So that's why this first entity has an actual name rather than just entity zero. Now finally, we can look at the system code and we'll go through it in their approximate order of execution. So first off is the remove dead system, which removes entities of dead enemies and also the player if they have died. At the top here, it says the system updates in the initialization system group, which is the first of the three system groups. There's initialization, simulation, and then presentation. So this is done in the first group. And on each update, for each entity with a health component and a translation component, we check if the health value is less than or equal to zero. Well, if so, we check if the entity is the player entity by checking if it has the player tag component. And if so, we invoke player died of the settings model behavior. Otherwise, if the entity is an enemy as represented by the enemy tag, then we want to destroy the entity and create a bullet impact where the enemy was. Post update commands is a field of the system and it's an entity command buffer that's going to be played back after this system finishes updating. So here we're just recording our intention to destroy the dead entity enemy and then the entities are actually destroyed after this on update returns. The next system, turned towards player, is what makes the enemies always rotate to face the player. This time it's a job component system so that the work can be done in a job. The turn job that we define, note it's burst compiled, and it operates upon entities that have a translation, a rotation, but also an enemy tag. Except we don't need to actually read or write the enemy tag, that's why it's specified through this attribute, rather than in the list with the other components. In the job we have a float3 defining the player position the target to turn towards. And so for each entity, we're going to be reading the position and reading and modifying the rotation. By subtracting the position from the player position, we get a vector pointing towards the player. We zero out the Y component because we always want our enemies rotated flat on the XZ plane. And to get a quaternion to set as a new rotation, the Unity Mathematics package has this quaternion.look rotation where we specify a facing direction and an up direction. So that's how the job is defined, and then in on update, first we check if the player is dead, because if so, we don't want the enemies to rotate towards the player anymore, instead they should just keep going straight. But otherwise we create a job, setting the player position from the settings class, and then scheduling the job. As I mentioned in a previous video, when you have an I job for each, you pass in the job component system itself as the first argument, because the schedule method wants to register the query that gets built with the job system. There's a query implicit from how the job is defined, and the component system needs to keep track of that for the sake of managing the job dependencies. Next, we have the move forward system, which moves forward both the enemies and the bullets. So our move forward rotation job here operates upon anything that has a move forward tag, but also has a translation, rotation, and move speed component. The job needs to know how much time is advanced, so we have this dt delta time field, and in the execute here, all of the components are read-only except for the translation. It's the translation that's getting updated. The vector of change is dt times our speed value multiplied by a forward vector derived from our rotation. And this change vector is then added to the current position, which we assign as the new position. In on update, we create the job and schedule it unconditionally, and we get dt from time dot delta time. Next, we have the player transform update system which is responsible for setting the player entity position from the player game object position. If the player is dead, they're not going to move, so we don't need to update this position. Otherwise, for all entities with the player tag, which should just be one entity, we want to set the translation, so we assign to pause here this new translation with the player position from settings. Next, we have the collision system, which is the most complicated system, so we'll come back to this. First, let's look at time destroy system, which is the last one. This system is what destroys our bullets when their time to live component is less than or equal to zero. Like in the remove system, we're going to be destroying entities and so we'll need an entity command buffer, but we're going to be recording our commands in a job which isn't necessarily going to be finished immediately after the on update here returns. And so we can't use post update commands. Instead, we want to get an entity command buffer from the end simulation entity command buffer system, which is the entity command buffer system that updates at the end of the simulation group. 
So in onCreateManager here, which actually should be onCreate, onCreateManager is deprecated, upon creation of the system, we're getting the end simulation entity command buffer system from our world and assigning it to this field buffer, which is really not appropriately named because it, it itself is not the entity command buffer. It's an entity command buffer system, but uh, close enough. And so down here, uh, when we create our job, the coding job, we're going to need to call create command buffer and make it concurrent. And the reason it must be concurrent is because I job for each with entity here, the calls to execute may be split up into separate sub jobs and those sub jobs may run on separate threads. So the entity command buffer might be used concurrently. That's why it must be concurrent. Anyway, this calling job, it operates upon everything with a time to live component and in execute, it decrements the time to live by the delta time. And if the time to live then is less than or equal to zero, we destroy the entity using our concurrent entity command buffer. Note here the job index parameter we get in execute. We want to pass this into any method calls on our concurrent entity command buffer for reasons I'm not entirely clear on, but that's what it's there for. And note also that when we schedule the job, we call this method to tell the entity command buffer that the job has to complete before the entity command buffer should play back. So this is how the bolts get destroyed when they time out. Lastly, looking back now on the collision system, if any enemy gets within radius of the player, then we want to decrement the player's health to below zero. And likewise, we want to check for collisions between any bullet and any enemy. And when there is such a collision, then the enemy health drops below zero. Note that because this collision system is updated after the remove dead system, the player and enemies don't actually die in the same frame where they get hit. They actually die in the next frame. As long as the frame rate isn't super low, then the user can't tell the difference. Whereas in the other systems, we used ijob for each. Here we're using ijob chunk. And when you schedule an ijob chunk, you have to pass in a query. So in on create, we create some queries. Player group should just match the player because it looks for the player tag. Enemy group is the same, except instead of player tag, it looks for the enemy tag. And bullet group matches bullets because only bullets have the time to live component. I suppose time to live here should be read only like translation but it's actually not accessed at all in the job anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So in this collision job, the chunks are gonna have a health component and a translation component. And so we need these archetype chunk component type fields to get those arrays using get native array down here. In the case of translation, we only need to read it rather than write, so we mark this read only. The job also needs this array of translations, which we'll just call trans to test against. And this too is read only. We're not going to modify any of the translations. And note here the deallocate on job completion. This special attribute makes sure that the native array here is disposed of once the job completes. The radius here is the radius of collision. If two translations are within radius distance of each other, then they're considered to be colliding. So anyway, for each chunk, we have its array of healths and its array of translations. For each entity, we're accumulating a damage number. Every time there's a collision, then we add more to the damage down here, add damage plus one. And if the damage is greater than zero, then we subtract it from the health of the entity. Then for each entity of this chunk, we perform an inner loop through all of the trans to test against. And so we do a collision check between the position of the entity and each position here, pause two, of the trans to test against. Now the collision test here simply takes in two flow threes. And through the Pythagorean theorem, we can see if these two positions are within radius distance of each other. Though note here, actually, instead of radius, we're using radius squared because that just makes the calculation here cheaper. Because we only care about relative distance, we can get the distance squared between these two positions and compare that against the radius squared, which is cheaper than having to compute the actual distance between the two positions because that requires getting a square root, which is an expensive operation. So there's just a little trick to avoid that uh, extra expense. Anyway, that's how we do our collision check. It is certainly not the optimal way to do collision detection between many objects. A proper collision detection algorithm would involve, at the very least, a so-called broad phase test that uses axis aligned bounding boxes. But anyway, this is meant to be a simple example. Just keep in mind, this is certainly not the most efficient way to do collision detection. Anyway, that's how the collision check is performed. And when there is collision, we increment the damage, which is subtracted from the health. As currently configured in our game, the health of the player and the enemies is always one, so a single collision is an instant kill. But if we set the health to something greater, then it could take multiple bullets or multiple collisions to destroy enemies and to destroy the player. So in the update of this collision system, 
Again, we're doing two sets of collision tests. Collisions between the player and enemies, and collisions between enemies and the bullets. So we're creating two collision jobs, EVB as in enemies versus bullets, and PVE as in players versus enemies. Both of these jobs need the archetype chunk component type values for the health and translation, so we get those. From settings, we get the radius collision value for the bullets to the enemies and for the enemies to the player. And note that for the job, we're passing in the square of these radii. And for the trans to test against, well, in this first job, it's the entities versus the bullets. When we schedule the job, we pass in the enemy group, so the chunks are going to be the enemy entities. And for each enemy, we want to test it against every bullet. So from our bullet query, we call to component data array translation to get an array, which is a copy of all the translations of all of our bullets. And then likewise down here for PVE, players versus enemies, it's the player query past the schedule. So in this case, the chunk loop is always going to be iterating just through one entity. But for trans to test against, we get an array, which is a copy of all the translations of all the enemies. You may be concerned that copying these arrays every frame is expensive and, well, it's not the cheapest thing we might do. But because, say, here for each enemy, we have to iterate through every bullet, well, then we're paying a big cost in terms of memory access anyway. Like, say, if we have a thousand entities and so we have to iterate through this bullet translation array a thousand times, well, the upfront copy has about the expense of reading through it once, so it's really not adding much to the workload. Accessing all this data a thousand one times is not that much more than a thousand times. So that's everything for the code of this example. You may be wondering, how are these entities all rendered? Well, that's handled by the hybrid.rendering package, which has systems that run in the presentation group. It's the render mesh system here that does the actual drawing of the bullets and our enemies. All we need to do in our code is make sure our entities have the right components, which they do. The details of this, though, I'll cover in later videos. This is going to be a brief rundown of some ECS components that aren't particularly well documented at the moment, including object components, chunk components, shared components, system state components, and blob assets. Information about these things is currently a little sparse, so I'm not entirely confident that everything I say will be 100% accurate, but I think it's mostly accurate. Anyway, firstly, object components are pretty much what they sound like. With version 0.2 of the entities package, you can now have classes that implement the iComponent data interface. And this defines a component type, which you add to your entities with a special method, add component object. And because these components are instances of classes, they are managed objects and so are not directly stored within the chunks. For each object component type, there's an array that holds all of the object component values of that type. And what gets actually stored in the entity is just an index into this array. And so here, for example, in this code, we're first getting the default world, which now you have to access through this new property, uh, default game object injections world, rather than the, the much more brief active. They decided that active was too convenient, too brief, uh, encouraging people to misuse it. And so <laughs> now they have this much longer name. Anyway, we get the entity manager and create an instance of this component type, a dog, which we call D. We create an entity and add that component object to it then create a second entity and give it the same component object. How this actually gets stored is that both entities actually have a different index into the same array, but those two slots of the array store a reference to the same dog object. So these two entities, yes, are indirectly sharing the same object component. So when we then assign seven to the X field and then get this object component from the two entities using the method get component object, for each entity, we're getting back the same dog object. And so printing out d.x prints seven in both cases. And then lastly here, when we remove the component from the first entity, that's affecting only the first entity. The second entity still has its reference to the same object. So with object components, our entities now can reference managed objects. However, there's still the general restriction that within jobs, you don't touch managed objects. It can actually technically be done safely if you get a so-called GC handle to the managed object, but if a job is burst compiled, then it shouldn't touch managed objects, period. So in practice, you really should just not touch managed objects in your jobs. Outside of jobs, however, in like regular component systems, you can still access these components. A chunk component is pretty much what it sounds like. It's a component that belongs to a chunk itself, not to the entities within a chunk. These chunk components are not defined as distinct kinds of components or just regular I component data, 
but to add a chunk component to an entity, you use add chunk component data rather than add component. And be clear, when you add a chunk component to an entity, you're modifying its archetype and thereby determining which chunk it can belong to, where it can be stored. But for that individual entity, there is not a unique chunk component value. For the whole chunk it's stored in, there's only one chunk component value per chunk component type. So here, for example, we create two entities, E and E2, and we give them both a chunk component of type cat, but they also both get a regular component of type cat. So within a chunk that stores these entities, each entity has its own cat, but there's also a chunk component cat that belongs to the whole chunk, and there's just one of those per chunk. So within a single archetype, a component type can be used as a regular component, but also a chunk component. Then to access this chunk component, we get a reference to the chunk of entity E, and then we call set chunk component data to set the cat's x value to be three. To access a chunk component value, we can do so via the chunk, but also more conveniently, we can do it through an entity. So here where we call get chunk component data, pass in an E2, we're getting the cat of the chunk in which E2 belongs. And here in this example, because our two entities both belong to the same archetype and there's only two of them, then it's virtually guaranteed they're stored in the same chunk. And so when we print out the X of this cat from E2, it prints three, because this is a cat shared by both of the same entities because they belong to the same chunk. Lastly here, when we remove a chunk component, because it's distinct from a regular component, there's a special method, remove chunk component. So the first method here is removing the chunk component cat, the second method is removing the regular cat component. Be clear though that this is just affecting the archetype of the entity. And so with both these calls, the entity is getting moved to a different chunk. This is in no way destroying the chunk component. Only when the chunk itself is destroyed because it no longer has any entities, only then do the chunk components get destroyed. Also understand that perhaps unintuitively, when an entity is moved from one chunk to another, the chunk components of either chunk are not affected. They don't get modified. It's only when set chunk component data is called, only then does the chunk component value get modified. Again, these chunk components really belong to the chunks themselves, not the entities within that chunk. Now, how are these chunk components useful? Why would you create them? That's a more complicated question. There aren't super obvious use cases. The most prominent use of them I've seen so far is in regards to culling. It's useful to store in a chunk a single bounding area that encompasses all of the bounding areas of the entities within it. And so there's a culling system that computes this bounding area from all the entities within each chunk. As long as none of the entities within a chunk are modified since the last time this bounding area was computed, then it's valid for the chunk. That's the only real use case I've seen so far for chunk components, but I'm sure there are many others. Next, we have shared components, which are defined with their own special interface, I shared component data. And the idea of these shared components is that all entities within a chunk share the same value for a shared component type. But unlike with chunk components, these shared components logically do belong to the individual entities. So when you set shared component values, you set them on individual entities. And because an entity then will have a different value from all the other entities within its chunk, it has to move into a chunk that shares its new value, or if there is no such chunk, a new chunk has to be created. So say I have a thousand different entities of a particular archetype, and that archetype includes a shared component. Well, if the value of that shared component is different for each one of the thousand entities, then each entity will have to be stored in its own chunk. That situation, of course, is very wasteful, and in fact defeats really the whole purpose of ECS, because then you would have each entity spread all throughout memory in different places. So generally when we use shared components, we do so in cases where for that component type, many entities will be sharing the same values. The idea being that for all entities which share the same shared component value, we only have to store the value once. Like object components, shared components are not stored directly within chunks. Instead, all the shared components of a particular type are stored externally in an array, and each chunk with that shared component just has an index into that array. Now, to avoid storing these shared component values redundantly, and to also properly put entities into chunks that match their shared component values, our shared component types need to be testable for equality, and for the sake of faster quality tests, we also want to compute hash codes. So our shared component types must implement the iEquatable interface, which has the equals method, and we should override the getHashCode method, which every type inherits. 
Rather than implement these manually though, we can have Visual Studio generate them for us, and these auto-generated methods are generally just fine for our purposes. In this example, we have a shared component type mouse with two fields, an int x, and a name field, which is a single class with a string field. We could of course represent the mouse's name directly as a string, but I made the name field its own class for demonstration purposes on the next slide. Anyway, note that I've generated the iEquatable interface and the getHashCode methods for both these types. For the name class, doing this is optional, but then when we compare our mouse type for equality or get its hash codes, the equality and hash codes would be based just on the identity of the name field, not its actual value. In some cases, that might actually be what you want, but otherwise the name class should have these methods. So here we're creating two entities and giving them both a shared component of type mouse. And note that when we add a shared component, we have to provide a value upon adding the component. And in this case, we're giving the same mouse value to both entities. So because these entities have the same archetype, there's just two of them, and their shared component values match, then they're going to be in the same chunk. When we get the chunk of both E and E2 here and test them for equality, it returns true. When we then assign Ted to the string field of the name within the mouse, we're effectively modifying in place the existing shared component of both these entities. But if we then set the mouse component of the first entity with the same mouse struct, even though it equals the mouse as currently stored already in both components, Unity will think it's different because now it's computing a different hash. And so now it's gonna move the first entity into a different chunk even though both entities actually really are storing the same value. So in the next line, when we get the chunks of both entities and test them for equality, we get false. They're not the same chunk. If though we call get shared component data on E2, we get back a mouse struct whose name value has the same string Ted. So here in a sense, we've actually fooled Unity. We're probably doing something we shouldn't, but understand exactly what's going on. When you add or set a shared component, only then does it compute the hash code and test it for equality with other entities. If the shared component includes mutable managed objects, those can get mutated unbeknownst to the entity manager, and so you can end up with strange scenarios like this one. Of course, you probably should just avoid these scenarios, and in fact, generally you should avoid mutating any managed objects that are part of any existing shared components. I think this kind of scenario is probably why in the documentation they say that in a future version they probably won't allow shared components to store managed objects. For now though, they still can, and in fact, one of the most prominent uses of shared components is that they're used in the hybrid.rendering package for storing mesh data. The render mesh component is a shared component type that keeps a reference to a standard Unity mesh object. By making the render mesh a shared component type, well then firstly, it can have a reference to managed objects, but then secondly, when entities get rendered, they're effectively grouped into chunks such that all entities within a chunk share the same material and mesh. Effectively then, the entities are laid out in memory in a way that's optimal for rendering. Now this will have to change in the future once shared components can no longer reference managed objects. I believe the idea at that point is that instead they'll lean on object components and what are called blob assets, which we'll talk about in a minute. Lastly, in regards to shared components, there are some scenarios like the rendering example I described where you want to iterate through all entities which share the same component value. So here in this example, we create a query that just matches on any chunk that has the mouse shared component type. And then we pass a list of type mouse to get all unique shared component data, which will populate the list with every unique mouse value. In the loop here then, for every mouse in the mice list, we're setting the mouse value as a filter on the query, such that the query will now only match chunks which have that particular mouse value. In the rest of the loop, we then get all the chunks matching this query, and then for each chunk, we can go through all of its entities and do our business. Just be clear that for all the entities in the inner loop, they share the same mouse value. So we only need to access the mouse value once per iteration of the outer loop. So again, in the rendering example with our render meshes, using the same pattern for each unique render mesh, we can efficiently batch together the rendering of all entities with the same render mesh. Next, we have system state components. What these are concretely is very simple, but understanding how to use them is a little trickier, and I actually really have no idea why they're called system state components. The name is quite strange to me. 
Anyway, the difference between a system state component and a regular component is that when you destroy an entity, if it has any system state components, all the non-system state components get removed, but the entity is not actually destroyed. You can no longer add new components to the entity, but the entity is not actually destroyed until you remove all of the system state components. So here in this example, we have a regular component bird and a system state component rat. And when we create an entity and give it both of these components, notice we just use the regular methods for system state components. And when we call destroy entity, the entity is not really actually destroyed, but the bird component is removed, though the shared component rat is not. And so has component for bird will return false, but has component for rat returns true. Only once we remove the rat component does the entity no longer exist. So how are these things useful? Well, the primary use case, as far as I understand it, is sometimes when entities are destroyed, you might want to do some cleanup work. And so if you give entities of an archetype a system state component, then we can detect when destroy entity has been called on those entities by querying for entities which have the system state component but don't have the other regular components. And so you put any information you need to do the cleanup work in the system state component, and in a system with the right query, you can get the entities that need to be cleaned up. And once you've done your cleanup work, you can then actually destroy the entity by removing the system state components. Also note that we can create shared system state components. So you can have shared components that stick around after death too. Lastly, we have blob assets. And again, the name is a little strange to me because these are not assets in the usual Unity sense. They're not files stored within your project as assets. They're not stored in an asset database. Perhaps though, that will change in the future. I don't know. So maybe in the future, it'll make more sense. But anyway, they're called blob assets where a blob is a binary large object. Each blob is a piece of data within a single native allocation. The data within a blob is all immutable. So blobs are safe to use from jobs without any concern for coordination. No safety checks are required or anything because the data is only ever read. And within the blob, the data can contain internal pointers, pointers that point to other parts of the same blob. But these pointers are represented not as actual memory addresses, but merely offsets. So they're merely relative within the blob. And so if you want to serialize these blobs, it's extremely fast and trivial. It's as optimal as possible because we can simply just copy all the bytes. We don't have to worry about fixing up references or anything like that. So we can very trivially then serialize blob assets out to files and then deserialize them back into memory with no special logic required whatsoever. It's just a straight copy. So what are blob assets useful for? Well, potentially all sorts of things. Anytime you need a large binary piece of data, as long as that piece of data doesn't really need to change, then you can represent it as a blob. So for example, you might want to represent, say, mesh data in the form of a blob. Now, there are some problematic uh, use cases like, say, textures, I believe, because with textures, there are standard binary formats that may not conform to the blob representation. So this is not necessarily a solution for every piece of binary data, but there's a lot of stuff that can be represented as blobs just fine. So now, how do we create blobs? Well, to make a blob, we start by creating a blob builder object. And for each blob we create, there is a so-called root, which is a struct value, an ordinary struct. So in this case, our root is a house type, which has three elements, a cost of type int, a door of another struct type called door, and a name of type blob string. The blob string value itself does not actually contain string data. The blob string itself just contains the length of the string, I believe both the logical length in terms of characters and also the length in bytes. And it also contains an offset pointing to the other part within the blob where the characters of the string are actually stored. So in this example, the blob will start out with the root house. The root always comes first in the blob. The door struct which it contains is just another struct that's inline stored within the outer struct. But then the blob string will have an offset that points to after the root house where all the characters of the string will be stored. So this blob is actually just going to have two elements, the root house and the string data that follows. Possibly the root house will be followed by a little padding for the sake of alignment. When we construct the root, note that we're getting a reference to the house. We want a ref to a house rather than just a house value because a non-ref local house variable would just be its own copy. We want to modify the house actually stored in the blob. And so here, when we assign to the cost and the height, we're actually setting the values that will be stored in the blob. We call allocate string, passing in the value we want for the string and the reference to the blob string that's going to point via offset 
to where the actual string data is stored. Now, the builder is just how we set up the data we want, but we don't get our actual final blob until we call create blob asset reference. This creates the actual allocation, which will be our blob, and copies all the data from the builder into the actual blob. Because when we make the blob, we don't know how big it's going to be, and we want it to be mutable, and we don't know how everything's going to be arranged, the allocation for the root and the string and any other elements are actually just staging that has to be copied into the actual blob. And then once we have our blob, we no longer need the builder, so we dispose of it. Now that we have a blob asset reference, we can read its data, and we can store this reference in components. The blob asset reference itself is a blittable type, and so you can store it in regular entity components. Now here's another example where within the blob we're using a blob pointer, blob PTR. And so it's the same structure as before, except instead of the root house directly containing the door struct, it contains a pointer to a door. And a blob pointer is just an offset pointing to elsewhere in the blob. So our blob this time is going to contain three elements, the root house, the character data of the name string, and the door struct. So we create our builder and construct its root like we did before, but to set the door field, we call the builder's allocate method, passing a ref to the door field of our root house, and we get back a reference to a door struct, which we can then set up. Here we assign nine to its height field. And lastly, we set up the blob string just like we did before. So now when we call create blob asset reference, the actual blob is allocated, and the builder takes the stage data and copies it into the actual blob and sets the pointer offsets as needed, and so now we can use our blob. To get at the data within the blob, well, first we access the root with the value property, but absolutely make sure to get it by ref, not because we want to mutate it, but because when we access elements of the blob through pointers, through the offsets, they are relative from where that pointer is in memory. If we got a local copy of the house, the house would be on the stack, and then when we access any elements through offsets, we would be indexing into the call stack, which is not at all what we want to do, and in fact is quite dangerous. We want a reference to the actual struct as stored in the blob, so that when we get a ref to the door's value, we're getting the very same door that's actually stored in the blob, not a copy. Now, come to think of it, these blobs are supposed to be immutable, but I don't think there's anything actually stopping you here from, say, modifying the height of the door. So it's on you to avoid doing that. Doing so is not actually going to necessarily create any problems, assuming your blob isn't currently being used in any jobs. But again, it's really not how blobs are intended to be used, so you probably shouldn't do it. Now, last thing in this example, again, there's not really any good reason to make a blob pointer here to a door instead of just directly storing the door in the root. But in larger, more complicated blobs, you might want to create some kind of structure of elements pointing to each other. Like, for example, maybe you want a blob which is a graph of nodes, and so you create these node elements that point to each other, and a single node might be pointed to by multiple other nodes. In the last example, we're replacing the blob pointer to a door with a blob array of doors, so our house can now have multiple doors. The blob builder code looks very much the same, except for the allocate method, we pass a second argument, the number 5, which means this will return an array of 5 doors. And so allocate here is returning a blob builder array value. The distinction between blob builder array and a regular blob array is that blob builder arrays are mutable. And so in the next line, when we use the index operator on our blob builder array, it's returning a ref to the element of the array. So when I assign 9 to the height of doors subscript 0, that's actually mutating the first door stored in the array. It's doing what we want. It's not mutating the copy. But then once we've built our blob to access this data, we again have to be very careful to use ref, because otherwise we might end up indexing into the call stack, which is very bad. So here I'm getting a reference to the root house, and then getting a reference to the doors within the house. And this doors2 is a blob array, not a blob builder array, so we can only read from it. When we get the door of the first index, we again get a ref. In this case, it's not strictly necessary. If we got a copy of the door, well, the door itself doesn't contain anything with pointers, so there's no danger with the individual door of indexing to the call stack. But for consistency and safety, I recommend just always using ref, even in cases where it's not strictly necessary. Just to make sure you understand what blobs look like in memory, here's a diagram from an official Unity presentation. In this blob, the root is of type node graph, which is made up of a single blob array of nodes, and each node itself is made up of an array of ints and a float 3. So in the diagram, it's showing the memory as laid out left to right and top to bottom, with each block representing 4 bytes. 
The fact that the lines have different numbers of blocks is not significant. The blocks are presented in a way that's just more orderly to look at. So first in the blob, that top line is our node graph. The node graph is made up of just a single blob array, and the blob array value is really just two int values. The second int, the value 5, is the length of the array, and the first value 8 is the offset to where the array is actually stored. Because the offset is relative from the beginning of the blob array value itself, in this case it's 8 bytes from the start of the node array to where the node array is actually stored. And as you can see, the next five lines are all the nodes that make up the array. Each node itself starts with a blob array, which is again two values, first an offset and then a length, and then the float 3, which is itself made up of three floats, an x, a y, and a z. The int array of the first node is located 100 bytes after where the blob array value is, and it has a length of 2. The int array of the second node starts 88 bytes after that blob array value and has a length of 3. The int array of the third node starts 80 bytes after that blob array value and it has a length of 2, and so forth. And if the pattern seems a little strange, it's because the int arrays come in different sizes. That's why the difference between the offsets is not uniform. Again, be clear that the offset is relative from where the offset itself is stored. To find the int array of the last node, you're counting 64 bytes from the start of where the 64 is itself stored. So hopefully now you understand what a blob asset looks like in memory. Thanks to the use of offsets rather than actual memory addresses, we can copy a blob byte by byte without having to fix up any references. I've been following the development of Unity's ECS since it was introduced about a year and a half ago and I've made a few videos about it. Here I just want to talk about some problems I see. This is going to be kind of a rough draft video, hence Comic Sans for the font. I can't say that I've put Unity ECS to serious use in a, in a real proper project yet, but at this point I think hardly anyone has. There are key pieces that are still not in place, and what's already there is evidently still in flux. And so there's still time for these problems to be addressed, and I hope that they do get addressed. Anyway, the first problem I see is perhaps really just a messaging problem. At its core, ECS is basically just a way to structure data and also code. And the general idea is that the entity component structure is a way of laying data out in memory that is much more uh, cache friendly and therefore much more efficient. And that's all true. The problem I see is that the entity component structure is both awkward and suboptimal for cases where you need to make relations between your data. If I have an ordered list of things or a hierarchy of things or some kind of interconnected graph, Expressing those relations in ECS is, is doable. From one entity component, you can reference another entity. And that works fine for cases where the relations are an incidental part of the data, like something that's only uh, utilized in minority cases. But if it's like a really key thing about what your code does is to traverse these relationships of, of the elements, then it gets really awkward and also suboptimal. It's not really efficient because the ECS structure is all about, I'm going to go through all these entities with a certain set of components and as I iterate through them, I'm going to operate upon each one individually. But anytime you follow a reference from one entity to some other entity it might reference, well, that's an expensive lookup. In fact, even more expensive than in a conventional object-oriented structure because you have to use a lookup table instead of just following the memory address. So it's even more expensive when you follow references. And while perhaps this may not be the predominant uh, scenario in most game code, that's the bet that ECS makes that these relation traversal cases are a minority of your logic, well then on the whole, sure, ECS is a great benefit. But because I think in principle games can be about anything, I can imagine cases where traversing relations between my elements of data is the primary case, the, the thing that is the bulk of my code logic and also the thing that's going to kill my performance when it's expensive. So the point here simply is that obviously there's no such thing as a universally optimal data structure. There's nothing that is ideal for all possible cases. The bet with ECS is that we have this entity component structure that is optimal for most cases, and that seems valid to me. It's just there are clearly exceptions is the problem. In their messaging, I don't think Unity has made this clear. I think sometimes they've just been overeager to sell it to the point of being misleading. From what I've seen on forums and talk about ECS, uh, particularly from people who aren't really bought in, people who aren't like regulars on the on Unity's ECS forum, I see a lot of confusion and consternation about, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. What about such and such system for my puzzle game? 
what about such and such inventory system? Like relations are key to my game logic. And you're asking me to structure the data in a way that's both very awkward from the standpoint of my code simplicity, and then also actually even a, a drain on performance, not a benefit. Let me give a concrete example. Like say you're making a chess game. The most obvious way to represent a chessboard is as an array of squares, and you just have 64 slots in your array, each one representing a square, and the value in the square re represents what piece is currently occupying that square. And so when you do your logic of like how you can move your bishop diagonally, you just figure out, given the structure of the array, you can traverse and see if your bishop can move diagonally in such and such direction, right? If it's not blocked by other pieces or, or whatever, right? If there is a way to do that kind of logic in ECS, which I'm sure there is, it's just really, really obvious and strange and weird. It's a kind of logic that requires bringing together and analyzing simultaneously many disparate pieces of data, which is not what ECS is about. ECS is about, you're gonna iterate again through all these things that have this certain set of components and process each one independently of the others. For very abstract game logic problems like moving chess pieces on a board, I'm sure you could figure out some way to represent the logic that way. It would just be very strange. To be clear, I'm not saying that you want to stick with the old game object component structure. Regardless of whether I use DCS or game objects and components, I wouldn't represent my chessboard as a bunch of game objects. I basically put together my own custom data structure where the data doesn't have to be spread everywhere in memory. It can be reasonably spatially coherent, but I think it's clearly an example where the entity component structure just doesn't make any sense. It'd be very, very strange. Now, when it comes time to render my pieces, maybe I take my board representation the, the 64 slot array and keep it in sync with an entity component representation of the presentation of the board. That all makes sense to me. But when it comes to the game logic itself for this kind of problem, I don't want to have to think in terms of entities and components. I'm sure there are plenty of game logic problems that do fit well enough in the entity component model. But what I'm saying is there are problems that clearly don't. Again, I think this is not really a problem with ECS itself per se. It's just a messaging problem. It's an education problem. Anyway, the second problem I see with ECS is the verbosity and inelegance of the API and in parts. The most obvious part of the problem and something really easy to fix is that simply some of the API names are just really way too verbose unnecessarily. Uh, this is mainly because the type names they've chosen for a lot of the key things are just unnecessarily verbose. And then that pollutes everything else because you have all these methods that include the type name, the full type name in the method name. And now the method names grow out to be way too long. And not in a helpful way, not in a way that makes it easy for learners. It actually just makes it harder because you end up with these German compound names where if you're unfamiliar with the, with the elements involved here, like end simulation entity command buffer system, is it an entity command and a buffer system? Is it a command buffer that's an entity, but also a system? No, you have to recognize that there's a thing called an entity command buffer and there are entity command buffer systems. And this is the end simulation version of that. But if you don't already know that, this is totally unhelpful. Like, it's, it's more confusing than, than meaningful from the verbosity of the name. So the really obvious ones that jump out to me are that you have what they call an archetype chunk when there's no other kind of chunk in the API. I mean, I know internally they have something called chunk. And so I think they called it archetype chunk just to distinguish from the internal chunk, even though publicly you only deal with archetype chunks. So this should just be called chunk, obviously. The archetype's not adding anything. Chunks have an archetype, so why call it an archetype chunk? It doesn't make any sense, really. Uh, and then entity query. You don't have to call it an entity query. There's only one kind of query in the API. When you add different kinds of queries in the future, perhaps then you can add variants, but entity query, what they call an entity query, is obviously going to be the key kind of query you do, so it should just be called query. And then entity archetype, again, there's no other kind of archetype in the whole API, so why call it entity archetype? Just call it archetype. Entity command buffer, sure, it involves a, a buffer of commands concerning entities, but you really have to look at the docs before you understand what it does anyway. So it might as well be called something simpler. And if it, what it does is it records and then plays them back later, I would just call it a recorder. So this is the obvious starting point. Um, I would even go further though and say that the terms component and system are really non-ideal. I understand that ECS is an established thing, and so you would want to stick to the existing terminology, but it's not too late, I don't think, to change this. Entity, the term is okay. That doesn't mean anything already in Unity. Component is overly long, given how commonly it's used. 
And it obviously creates enormous confusion for, for people first coming to ECS. It creates an enormous confusion with what they already call components in, in Unity. It's absurd because every time I talk about components in a video or, or in a text that tries to explain what's going on, I have to specify, oh, no, no, entity components, not game object components. I have to, you have to retroactively go back and call the old component something much more verbose. So this is a huge problem. It's, it's really dumb. So you could just call it comp perhaps, and so you could stick to the ECS abbreviation. This is better, but I think still unnecessarily confusing with the old components. I would invent a new term. So I thought like maybe datoid or datum, and then I thought just that, just call it a dat, piece of data. Coin a new term, it's worth it. It's actually easier from a learner's perspective if you just coin a new term. And then we have system, which is problematic in, in two ways. One. If you say entity component system, people, of course, think you're talking about a system of entity components, but no, it's an architectural pattern where you have three things and system is one of those three things It's one of the nouns. So that's totally unnecessarily confusing. Um, and then system is just overly broad. It's overly generic. It could mean anything. Whereas really what it is, is just in your update loop, you have a series of steps. Each system is a step in the process. I would just call it a step. Maybe there's a better term, but step is pretty good, and it also starts with S, so you wouldn't have to change the S in ECS. So again, these better terms make it easier to talk about these concepts and not get confused with old concepts like the old components. But then on top of that benefit in the rest of the API, when you include these terms in the names of other things, those things get shorter too. So instead of I component data, which I don't know why it ever had data at the end anyway, let's say it's just called IDAT, and then component system, I don't think it needs to include the word component or any equivalent to begin with, so that can just be step, and then job component system, I would just call job step. Again, I don't think it's too late to change these terms. Maybe you can come up with something better than dat and step, but component and system are really problematic, and they should be changed before it's too late. From the learner's perspective, this stuff really adds up. You're trying to learn this thing with all these unfamiliar pieces, and if the terminology is unnecessarily verbose and confusing, it makes it awkward to talk about the thing, and it's just a constant drain on the learner's attention. Now, even if you make the names in the API less verbose, the API, because it really is more like a framework and is imposing structure on our code, it, it feels like it's introducing new language constructs. It really is kind of a problem that c -sharp doesn't have macros. Most job component systems and most systems that people write are going to follow an established pattern, yet this repeated pattern is not captured in any syntax. And so when you're browsing around code, say, and reading a bunch of unfamiliar systems, you have to be careful and check to make sure that it is just following the pattern. Like if 90% of your job component systems just don't do anything unexpected, they follow the usual pattern, you still have to be careful when reading code to make sure they follow the pattern. So you have all these systems that typically aren't very large in most cases, and yet you have to read them carefully. And so this is why it's not ideal that we don't have macros. So here, for example, this is code from the uh, Angry Bots demo. Um, this is the collision system. It's a job component system and it creates three queries. It in the update sets up the jobs, scheduling them, sets up the dependencies between them. And then here's the actual work uh, done in the collision job, what the collision job takes in and what it actually does in its execute method. And we have just this additional helper method down here. As you can see, this is about 96 lines. And as an experiment, I've taken this and rewritten it using my own invented macro syntax. So just imagine that C-sharp had like some kind of top level language construct macro system. I'm not proposing this necessarily as what they should adopt, but I'm just demonstrating what it could look like and what the gains would be. So this macro expresses all the same things above. It makes a number of things more convenient. Things that have to be expressed in multiple places are just expressed in one place. I won't explain the whole thing, but for example, uh, here we have to define three separate queries and give them names which is a problem when you have to name things that are only used in one place. That's always a, a burden because naming things is hard, naming them well. So here we can just keep them anonymous. We just define, hey, yeah, we're gonna create two jobs, one called EVB, one called PVE. Here are their dependencies. This one takes the input dependencies passed into update. This one takes the other job as its, as its dependency. And then here's what queries they use. It's just defining after colons, defining. Um, an anonymous query that it's going to use when it's executed. And then down in the update code, uh, when we have proper C-sharp code, it's always in curly braces. Um, so we're dropping into C-sharp syntax here, and this is just the, the code that runs upon update. Notice we don't actually schedule the jobs. That's done implicitly for us. 
we just said the fields of the job, in this case, just radius and other trans, because the health and the trans, those are component types that are hooked up for us. The macro is automatically configuring for us the, uh, what's it called, the archetype chunk component type business is doing that for us behind the scenes. Again, I won't explain all of this. I'm not attached to the particulars of it. I just wanted to demonstrate, hey, if you did adopt a macro system, you can get some really big wins because this is fewer than half the total lines. It's, well, close to, yeah, fewer than half the lines. And I think in terms of character count, it's half as many characters too, which is partly because I've changed some of the names to shorter names, but uh, mostly it's because we're just getting rid of a lot of boilerplate. Anyway, if we could have macros like this, you get most obviously more concision. It also, an important thing about macros is that they can sort of clamp down on possibilities. The problem with the API implemented as just straight C-sharp code and regular methods is it allows too much freedom, which sometimes you need. And so sometimes maybe you don't use the macro or the macro is sort of special outlets so that for cases where you need to do something strange that's not part of the usual pattern, you can fall back to custom behavior. But the great thing about a macro like this is that when I look at it, I can be assured that it's not doing anything strange, that it's just following the regular pattern. I don't have that assurance when I glance at this code up here. I've looked at the code and inspected every, every line to make sure it's not doing anything strange, but I don't know that at a glance. Whereas with the macros, you can much more easily at a glance see that it's following a regular pattern. Now, obviously, implementing a macro system or some kind of preprocessor that C-sharp doesn't currently support is a huge ask for Unity to do. I'm sure they've had many internal discussions about this. Even a straight preprocessor that would take this macro code and spit out a C-sharp file, writing that preprocessor itself is not really the problem. The problem is now you have to support this more complicated build chain, and now you have a tooling problem where you're working in this custom syntax that Visual Studio and other editors don't support. So that's a huge problem. So I understand why they haven't bit this bullet, but I'm not confident they'll ever find a way to structure the API to get close to this level of concision and clarity. I just don't see how it can be done. And there really is a large gap in clarity and concision. Anyway, something to think about. If you're curious about what's going on in the particulars of this syntax, just leave a comment. The last problem I see with ECS, briefly, is the learner's experience. So firstly, the official information they've released about DOTS and ECS isn't really concentrated anywhere. It's kind of spread around in too many places. This is the main page about DOTS, and there's not much info here on this page itself, but if you go down to the bottom, it does have links to their documentation, including the manual, the API reference, and a link to the forums. These are the main current sources, but then also uh, fairly critically, you also have these samples on a GitHub repo, which contains some additional documentation that has a few more links. Like here is a cheat sheet, except this is out of date. This is for version 0.0, .0 not 0 0.1. And you have this other page with links to other learning resources, primarily videos, but it's not including any videos beyond 2018. There's some more recent videos and this page hasn't been updated in all of 2019 for some reason. So the information is spread around into too many places, and many of these places are not being kept up to date, uh, including this page. If you go to the Unity YouTube page and you go through all the videos, you'll pick out some videos that are about ECS and have some more up-to-date information than what's on this page, for example. And kind of the worst thing right now is not only is all this information spread around too much, but you have a lot of outdated documents, links, and videos that include information that is not in the more up-to-date resources. And the API has changed quite a bit since those earlier materials. So there's really not a good place for learners to start at the moment. There's no clear place for learners to start. If you go through the manual, it's not really a long read because it's actually missing quite a bit of information. It's only covering really the core of the API and it's not really going into any advanced features. And then in the scripting reference, if you look in here, I mean, there's just obvious usability problems first off. Like for example here, this is an alphabetical list, but it's 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 confusing to scroll up and down through because uh, you, you look here, some some of the names are so long, they, they hang on to multiple lines. And so I find when I scroll up and down through it too quickly, I get confused about where I am in the alphabet sometimes if my eye has happened to look in the wrong place. So, I mean, there's a really simple fix for this. You just need to go in and using CSS, you need to like indent everything past the first line so that I don't look at this and think I'm looking at the C's when I'm actually in the middle of the E's, for example. 
It's a very simple, tiny thing, but it reflects the larger problem here of neglect. It just doesn't feel like anyone is taking care of this site and keeping it up to date or, or even improving it. Um, there are just other more serious usability problems, like the search is terrible. Like I I'll enter certain method names or property names and nothing will come up in the search. So you, you have to search Google or search the forums to, to find information about a lot of stuff. And worst of all is if we click on most any of these things is there's no information, there's no text. There are some exceptions. There's some actual, where was an example component system? There are cases where you get some actual pros explaining what these things do, but that's the, the minority. Most of this is really undocumented. All we have is information about what exists in the API, what methods and properties, but it doesn't give us any proper information. And in many cases where we get information, we get actual pros explaining what these things do, like some obvious questions uh, are not answered. So for example, I had this specific case the other day. Where's Entity Manager? Oh, I'm in the C. See, again, I just got confused looking at the, the list because of how it's hard to navigate by alphabet. Anyway, Entity Manager, where is it? Entity Manager. Um, this is annoying on the right because you can't scroll. I can't scroll just through this list. It scrolls the whole page. It's, it's just a little weird and confusing. Um, what was it? Oh yeah, create chunk. So this create chunk method creates a set of chunks containing the specified number of entities having the specified archetype. So first off, they don't say explicitly, does this create only new chunks? It's You're creating some number of new entities. Is it only putting them in new chunks exclusively? Either way, it should be said explicitly whether that's true or not. They also don't say what happens here when I specify the number of chunks and then the entity count, the number of entities I want to create. What if the number of entities I want to create doesn't fit in the number of chunks I specify? Like I ask for a thousand entities, but I say only one chunk and they can't fit all in one chunk. What happens? The documentation doesn't say. What happens if I provide too many chunks than I need for the number of entities? Do I get a bunch of chunks that are empty? What happens? It doesn't tell us, and this is really critical information. So even in the cases where we do get a little bit of prose describing what these methods and properties do, we don't get proper accounts for their behavior. And so we have to resort to asking on the forums or just doing an experiment ourselves and seeing what happens. We have to play scientist to work with this API. But again, most of this stuff isn't documented at all to begin with. There's no prose describing any of it. It's just auto-generated from the code. Sure, I understand ECS is still in development. The API is quite a bit in flux, but there are quite a number of people trying to use it or curious about it and trying to learn it, trying to get ahead of uh, this coming new stuff. But they're not really sufficiently explaining how it works. There's too much emphasis on selling the thing rather than actually explaining it. I'm sure the plans are to have much more complete documentation when this thing is actually released to a wider audience. But in the meantime, there are people trying to figure this out. You're making things much harder on them than it really should be. I mean, surely Unity has the resources for someone to take ownership of documenting this thing and actually explaining it at a level of detail that is actually needed for people to really use it. Even if most users of Unity aren't going to be touching ECS for, say, another two years from now, if you want to have good material for them, you really should get a head start on it. Even though much of this API surely will change, names will change, things will get added, things will get deprecated, I think there's great virtue in documenting and explaining something while it's in development because the explanation of a complex system is a really good smell test for the quality of its design. If something is hard to explain, that's a very good sign that it needs refinement. Particularly if you're talking about the design of an API, because of course one of the most important properties of an API is its clarity. 